wanted to talk uh, quickly about uh, a type of game problem that's called the prisoner's dilemma. It's uh, has a fairly long history, but it's become uh, very popular uh, as a thing to study in relation to theoretical biology, actually evolutionary biology, and also the theme of evolution of cooperation. Our, uh, the only example that you have is the evolution of cooperation in biology is like the flowers and the bees. Notice that uh, there are plants, the higher plants have flowers, and uh, these the flowers have a fertilization problem, particularly when there's a matter of cross. Uh, between them is not the individual plant is not self fertilized. Then uh, the pollen needs to be carried from one flower to another for the fertilization. And bees typically do that. So the, the bees serve the flowers and the bees also receive a payoff for their services in the form of the nectar and also pollen which they can collect. Um, and then they, they use that. So, uh, how does this evolve? The, the, the bees themselves, the flowers are separate, the flower plants are separate species, they're evolving for their own interests, but they are in this cooperation with the form of symbiosis. This can be related to game theory. The game theory is mostly considered of interest in relation to economics. So this is an example of a prisoner's dilemma game of the type that is studied in connection with this evolutionary biology. And this is in the form that the biologists prefer to consider it. So now according to some of the history of game theory, I suppose here. Um, it's not so long that there's a history of what is called game theory, but actually the first person to speak of game theory as a theory, mathematical theory, was a noted French mathematician in the 20s, Emile Borel. And he wrote Théorie des Jeux, which is the theory of games in French. And after him, there was the John von Neumann, who's from Hungary originally, he took a, up a theory, but he attained actually a mathematical theorem that Borel had missed. And he wrote, published a paper in 1928, which was when Nero was born, the theory de Gesellschaftstheorie, which is translated theory of parlor games, or really theory of social games, uh, Games that people might play socially for entertainment. But uh, the principle is it's, uh, what are now called two person zero sum games. There would be two players, and what one loses, the other game, games. That includes games like chess, the game Go, and uh, well, even table tennis. <laughs> well, except that you, the table tennis, I saw two persons playing table tennis last night. It's not exactly a strategy game. It's, it's not a game that's entirely a brain game. There's also some muscle coordination that's required. Where in chess, you just have to think about the move, but in, in table tennis, you have to have some good coordination. <coughs> And then later on, some years later, uh, 1944, von Neumann and Morrison, who was a economist, von Neumann was in Princeton at that time, at the Institute of Study. Morrison was a professor in the economics department at Princeton University. They wrote this book, Theory of Games and Economic Behavior. And that suggested the idea of game theory as very important 
in economics and very much something that could be used. They promoted that idea. They took uh, von Neumann's result, which had the existence of optimal strategies in these two first three things. Uh, optimal according to certain definition. And uh, then they went on from that. They tried to consider games with any number of persons, like any finite number of persons, like you were three corporations that might be involved in some way. Could that be measured, mathematically considered? What could they do? How can they cooperate? How can they form a good cartel? But that, that theory cannot be considered as really having been perfected. They had attempted it. Presumably, the Mormon was the leading spirit. But that area is still actually an open area of research. Game theory really is sort of, at the present time, it's, it's like algebra, uh, like uh, after the time of the Greeks. You knew how to solve uh, an algebraic equation, one unknown and of the first degree, which would be a linear equation, or the second degree, which would be a quadratic equation. If the quadratic formula typically learn that in high school. But then to go on to third degree or fourth degree, uh, that was more difficult. That was not learned until the Renaissance time. I was learning in Italy, and then later on I was learning you can't do the same sort of thing with the fifth degree equation, a higher degree. Only well, you can solve them well enough in terms of finding the uh, uh, a solution to an arbitrary degree of numerical accuracy, but you can't write down a formula for it with things like square roots or cube roots and stuff like that as an expression of the same form that you can for a quadratic and for a cubic are much more complicated. You can still do it. And after, after this, the early applications of game theory, are particularly the military, began to appreciate that one could use it in strategic defense planning. And a, a place would send up a, a sort of think tank research area called the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, California. And that was supported by the Air Force. They could consider intercontinental ballistic missiles, threats, how should the uh, how should the uh, nuclear weapons be stationed so they'd be more likely to survive an attack and uh, what could you do in the Cold War? How could you uh, play the game uh, of uh, the Cold War in the most effective way? A lot of money went in there. And I was myself at the Rand Corporation as a summer consultant uh, during three different summers, starting in 1950. And this Christmas dilemma game actually grew out of something, an experiment that was connected as the Rand Corporation, and then the name was attached to it by a mathematics professor who happened to be in California at the time. He was my thesis advisor at Princeton. I had gotten interested in the game theory, and I had to have a thesis advisor, so Professor, <coughs> professor Albert Tucker, who was also working in certain areas of game theory, quite the same as what I was thinking about. He became my thesis advisor. But, and part of the time he was in California, he was uh, still uh, officially my thesis advisor. I was in Princeton uh, writing up my stuff. And uh, he considered the example of uh, certain types of game, and he introduced the name First of all, I met at, at a talk he gave at Stanford University. And that popularized a concept. Now, what I did uh, that the Neumann and Monikstern didn't have, I introduced the distinction between cooperative and non-cooperative games. And uh, 
For zero sum two person games, it makes no difference because the essence of the game is there cannot be cooperation, the interests are simply opposed. But the interests, in a more general context, there may be not what is called zero sum, there may be the possibility that both of two players might have some possibility of profiting, both profiting, or more, they could, they could maybe all profit. So uh, I introduced the idea of a line cooperative game where the players are, in principle, must be understood not to do anything but simply play against one another and so I, that well, they don't even communicate. They can only make the moves. And then I found the form of solution that uh, reduces to the same as the Lyman's result for two person zero sum game. But beyond that, it was not it was a new thing. And it was called the, I call it the equilibrium point. Now it's called typically a Nash equilibrium by economists. And this is for non cooperative game. Now, here's an example of the game that Carl refers to the dilemma, but as studied by biologists, which they may be a sort of evolutionary situation. Uh, there was a, a sort of a, uh, I forget I'm not exactly what he's here was, Robert Axelrod. He had a paper and then he wrote a book called The Evolution of Cooperation. And he got computer studies that were based, again, on the prisoner's dilemma type of game. And, uh, that was uh, sort of the beginning of the biological study, although someone else had the idea earlier, uh, Robert Trivers, in his thesis at Harvard, he considered the evolution of altruism, that organisms might act in such a way that for the individual it's not good, but good for the others of a species. How does this evolve? How does the instinct evolve that maybe one type of ant might do something that's suicidal but good for the ant colony? And this is something that can be studied in terms of the mechanisms of evolution. We assume that evolution proceeds by natural selection. Now, this is a, a person's dilemma game of this general category, but as a form that biologists like to think of it, they have these, this is their favorite set of numbers. These are payoffs. This is what's called player one, and this is our player two. I have a label these strategies. Player two chooses a column, player one chooses this row, this one, or this one. And then player one is designated by this color, the orange color, and then that gets this payoff. Payoff, in principle, has to be measured in some, some measures called utility. And each player's utility really could be scaled up or down. But uh, in this form, it's symmetrical. Now, this is called player one's cooperative strategy, and this is to cooperate, this is called defect. This is the, what they like to say in describing it. Player two can cooperate or defect. If both cooperate, both get the payoff of three. <coughs> if both defect, they're not so bad off, they get two. But it's not as good as if they were both cooperating. But if one is saying the cooperative strategy, this is the best thing to do if they have it, if they can just agree about it and be bound by agreement, then both can get a payment of three. When playing the pay of the game. But <coughs> Player two 
is playing a cooperative life, <coughs> playing his column. And later on, he's choosing to defect, defect from this corporate ideal. Then he gets this great reward. He gets five instead of three, but player two is required to get zero then. So this is considered his, his temptation. He has a temptation not to work with. This is considered a good form in some of the the point of view of evolutionary biology. To have it, it is, nothing is really negative, but it's a great difference in positive. But then, if player two thinks that player one is going to detect, of course, player two, instead of getting five here, that also detects, he gets two. Player one gets two. Player two gets two. And so your one also gets two, so that is much better. So if, if he, it turns out, in terms of the concept of equilibrium points, of the equilibrium strategies of the non cooperative game, this is my original concept, that there's only one equilibrium point in this game, and equilibrium strategy is a strategy which is it's good against, it's optimal against what the other player is doing. But I'd rather, equilibrium part is a pair of strategies where each, each separate player's strategy is optimal, it's as good as anything against what the other player or the other players are doing. It can be any number. Concept applies to any number of players. Usually, you set up some Game described and not not performed. It's not a unique equilibrium, but this example has uniqueness. But the equilibrium, in terms of non cooperative behavior, is quite inferior from the, the cooperative ideal. The cooperative ideal, each player plays his set choices labeled cooperative three, and you get three. But non cooperatively the rational thing to do is really to defect. You get this, you get two, but if the other one is also defective, this is the best you can do. If while the other one is defecting, you try to cooperate, <coughs> then you don't get the three. You cooperate, one cooperates, but two is affecting when you get zero, and two gets the bonus of five. But this was originally introduced and popularized by Professor Tucker in another form, which is called this, this is the lemma. Now, I want to put in another number <coughs> corresponding to the Christmas dilemma concept. This is the way biologists like to look at it, but you could change the numbers around. It's essentially the same, same thing because you can just make a linear transformation on the payoff function of a separate player. It's like changing the units of this money. Like in, uh, if they were different countries, one might be German and French, they could be set, set up to describe being paid in British pounds, so that one is a German or French, but you could instead describe it in uh, marks for the German and francs for the French. Now, a typical prisoner's dilemma game. Is, is, is described like this. Instead of having non-negative payoffs, it would be like this. Minus one here. As I was saying in principle, 
but the interpretation is different. Cooperation minus one for both. Neither cooperating minus two, so they work. But if two of the cooperating and one is defecting, then you know, it's up to zero, which is better than either minus one or minus two. But but two is in a bad situation with minus two. And here's the interpretation. Uh, maybe slightly different than Professor Tucker's original version of it, but the way they people like to think of it now. You have two prisoners, they have been captured by the police, and they're accused of a crime, serious crime, felony, I guess, not murder. But uh, the police do not completely have the proof. The prisoners are working together, but maybe not directly. And so the, the, the police and law, law enforcement officials have a certain uh, amount of evidence. And uh, they could uh, send them to a year in prison, each of them a year in prison, if, if they don't get anything, don't get any confession. But if they, if they get a confession, they can do more. So, uh, what it means, if, if one of them will confess against the other, they can set, get a three year sentence against the other. So, they offer this deal. If, uh, if one of them will confess will accept, and accept a plea bargain for the state's evidence, then he can just let off. And the other one will be given a three-year term, the full blame for the crime. This, this might not entirely be the American justice system, but it's, it could, could be done. <laughs> on the other hand, if the other one confesses, if, and if, if, he, if either one that confesses, the other one will be will be given the three-year prison term. But if they both confess, then they get a four years total prison term, but two years for each one. So then there's no, no, no plea bargain. But in case of a plea bargain, one gets off free, and uh, one gets two years. And they get no confession, but they have sort of a lesser charge they can put each one up for a year. So this is a prison's dilemma. It's each of these players, if we presumably had been, uh, had been uh, Confederates in the crime, but now they are separate cells. They can't communicate. They're in solitary. And uh, each is offered a plea bargain. So we have the dilemma. That before going into that, they could have, could have said that they should cooperate. And they should neither should give evidence, and then they can only be charged as lesser charge and have only a year in prison. But once uh, they are in solitary, they're in a separate situation. If one of them takes a free bargain, he goes off, the other one goes to prison, so he's off. I assume that there isn't some great enforcer. But the one who would be accepting the free bargain has to fear uh, an ultimate vengeance. <coughs> so the question is, what what to do? If they can hold up on an original agreement, they could each have one year. This is the best thing from a really cooperative point of view. They would share the burden. It would be only a total burden of two years. And uh, he should be one year in prison. <coughs> if either one of them defects, the total burden is two years, but only one of them will, will, will bear the burden. And if both of them go for state's evidence, then it's a four year total burden, and each of them takes two years. So that's, that's the reason for them. 
rationally, the <coughs> equilibrium point analysis of it, the idea of the rational land property behavior, each one should try to get the free bargain. And if rationally, then he will expect to fail to get two years. But he doesn't. Um, the other one is going to try for it, and he tries to cooperate and not give any of it, then he's going to get to three years, and the other one is going to get off. But that's what the non cooperative analysis says it's rational to go for the free bargain. But this seems very paradoxical. This was a source of much criticism of the idea of a non cooperative solution in the beginning. So the experiments were done in the Rand Corporation. They did an experiment with a game similar to this, but it had been changed so that the payoff was one side was multiplied by a scale. It means one side was multiplied by and an additive constant was added. That made it the same as the theoretical non property game, but it made it appear non symmetrical. And there was a person called Flood and another person called Drescher at RAM, and they used as experimental subjects a man called John Williams and a professor from UCLA called Albion. And they had them play this repeatedly, a game like this, repeatedly under non cooperative conditions, and each <coughs> participant was making notes. And uh, the question is, what would they do if they played this thing repeatedly? It seems, although, if playing it once, this seems rational. Would this be rational to defect from cooperation? On a repeated play, these are intelligent, strategic-minded players. And one of them actually wrote a book called The Complete Straight Strategist, popular book relating to game theory concepts. As it turned out, when the experiment was carried out, about two-thirds of the time they actually managed to cooperate under these conditions of repeated play. But many times they were defective, and the defector would get a would get a benefit. But then, if they had been cooperating for a while, one of them would defect from cooperation. Then the next time, the other one would defect, and then they would then they might go back. So there was this punishment for the defector. So uh, what the biologists have done, and Axelrod. It was the first person to do computations with the automata that were playing in a strategic, according to a strategy. You have the idea of a repeated game. The game is not to do this once, but to play repeatedly. And you can set it up a form of a repeated game of this kind. So you you, the game is you play a person's dilemma game once, and then you have a nine tenths probability that you play it again. And then after that, if you have nine tenths probability, you play again. There you would maybe expect only like uh, order of ten games before it would end, but you never know when it's going to end. As long as you're still playing, you still expect something like uh, five or ten games. Of, I don't know exactly what the expected number is. Now, that sort of game becomes even theoretically different. It's possible then to have actually a theoretical non cooperative strategy that actually results in cooperation if, the, uh, if there is a repeating game. You can have each side could have a rational strategy, which results in this cooperative behavior in the individual game, but which is actually non cooperatively rational, so that it's rational even without 
just like sticking to some agreement with the other side. But this is possible in the repeated game because there's a possibility of, of a punishment for someone who defects from the, the pattern of cooperation. And the biologists go <coughs> to the experiments where you have automata that play the game. They represent an organism functioning according to its instincts. And these are allowed to evolve <coughs> so that they can change their strategy. They're, they have mutations. And this way you can study how Cooperation can evolve even though natural selection is sort of a non cooperative process where you have the survival of the fittest, a jungle, and every species might be contending against any other, but it's the members of the species must cooperate, like to have colonies and families. And there's even the symbiotic cooperation of species, like between the flowers, the plants, and, and the bees, and the hummingbirds. Now, uh, the biologists that study this, like journals like uh, Journal of Theoretical Biology, Evolutionary Biology, Mathematical Biology, um, they have introduced letters of these amounts. They study essentially the same thing, but with uh, letters that just describe the payoffs. They, 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 they seek a corroborated defect, but the idea is there's a better. The reward for cooperation is R. So uh, player player one gets this reward if uh, he cooperates and both are cooperating. The third, uh, the possibility of defecting when the other one is cooperating is this is a temptation called P. On the other hand. To kind of cooperate when the other one is defecting results in another payoff. This is called the sucker's payoff. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is described by S. And on the other hand, when, uh, when one is, is when, uh, if, player, uh, well, if, if player two suspects that player one is defecting from the cooperative ideal, then player two can also defect, punishing player one for his uncooperative behavior, and this gets the punishment payoff. So they they have these uh, these names that are preferred. And there have to be some relations for this to be really a good uh, person's dilemma form. And the, the relations are just that P is always considered like this. P is greater than R, which is greater than P, which is greater than S. So these could be positive or negative <coughs> if those relations are right. And the other relation is that 2 times R is greater than S plus T. Well, part of the importance of these is that that D, D is the rational non-cooperative behavior for a one-shot thing. <coughs> the person's dilemma, persons are in there only once, and what happens then determines the outcome. And that the rational behavior is both defects and both get the punishment. So 
But the punishment is not as bad as the sucker's result. <laughs> Now, uh, it's really interesting what, what results they get with the uh, automata that represent a species that behaves according to some instinctive strategy. And this can be worked out <coughs> computationally. And they're changing the patterns of the population of these automata uh, can be very slow. Thousands of generations in the simulation before some effective cooperation evolves. And uh, I'm, really, you know, I'm, I'm not a, really an expert on this, I was learning about it so briefly. <coughs> When the Simba strategies for repeated games, the interest of the, the biologists giving us the study of the evolution of cooperation is always repeated games, where the thing is not occurring once, but it's continually occurring. Like in every generation, there may be the problem of mating. So, how should the males be designed? Or the females, say, of some insect species, to mate effectively. <coughs> Maybe various differentiations with the question of size. What is the optimal size? What sort of noise should be made? What sort of coloration should there be? These things can all evolve. They can be separate genes <coughs> representing each characteristic. So the genes are considered to be like players that evolve according to what payoff they get. The payoff then is measured by reproductive success. So the good gene will tend to reproduce more than to there ultimately more copies of itself. That's its payoff. That's how these things are simulated. <coughs> now the, the strategy is the standard notation of strategy for this one called R D means always to take fifty percent. Uh, you know, the, uh, the thing simulation you just start out like this, or it looks or the, a, a random bunch of sh a bunch of random strategies, and then it becomes like this. Then a simple strategy is called tit for tat. This is really discovered in the early experiments that <coughs> experiment of done by Flood and Drescher at the Rand Corporation is two rather intelligent subjects who are writing comments. The tip for catch strategy is that you observe what happened to move before. If the other player defected from cooperation, then you defect. If the other player cooperated, <coughs> then you cooperate. This for depending on this path. Plus, uh, this has a sort of provision <coughs> since you start the thing, first time I am cooperating. So, in terms of a mechanism or robot, this requires a memory of one step. This is a, a, a pure strategy in terms of any game. It's not doesn't involve probability. Pure strategies do not involve probability. But an ideal strategy for chess could be a pure strategy where we make specific moves that would always start the same way, make the same response to any move of the other side. And we know that there exists an ideal strategy for chess which can either secure uh, uh, well, we don't know that white can actually secure even a draw. In principle, but it might be it might be that black is stronger. It's very unlikely, but it's, it's theoretically that's all that's known about chess. But whichever player is stronger, if 
If it were black, then uh, the way the black is structured, yes, then black has a strategy. The, in principle, there's a description of the move to make each time which would actually win, no matter what fight does. And there, without any randomization, anything to add confusion. That's called a pure strategy. But a mixed strategy there can involve some sort of choosing a move with certain probabilities, which uh, <coughs> uh, can, uh, well, I can't go into all of it, but that's, that's a mixed strategy. Now, in chess, if black is not stronger, it might be a draw against the principle. Then black has a strategy which can secure their all, but white also has such strength. And those would be pure strength. If white is really stronger, then white would have a strategy to secure a win, and then black really can't do anything. So. But anyhow, this tip for tat, the first move you cooperate, otherwise, you always uh, play against, uh, play according to the, the the last move of the other player, and if he cooperated, you cooperate. If he defected, you defect. And the simulations, this this type of cooperative behavior can begin to appear to some mutations in a population of of automata organisms organisms that are behaving in, in this fashion. And then in simulation, after a certain time, the majority will be behaving like that. And when they are, when two of these are matched together, they cooperate. And so they, they get off a better joint payment, payoff, than uh, if we're just getting an average of, of uh, the bad behaviors of sometimes winning and sometimes losing and defecting. But they find uh, in evolutionary simula uh, simulations that more, more, more complicated strategies can develop. Um, there can be a strategy that's <coughs> generous to for time. This tends to evolve in some of these simulations. And the one that's called generous tit for tat is one where there's still only a memory of one step. But uh, the organism that follows this strategy, if for the previous step that organism cooperated, but the, the other, the opposing layer defected, then the next step, this gives a probability basis. After defect, after losing to a defect in, on the other side, one third, one third chance cooperate. That's the retaliation. Now, ultimately, this tip or tap would always defect after the other side has defected. But then they, they could be locked into the process of defecting. They would be. This way, this one gives, uh, is more generous and is possible, considers the possibility of an error, maybe like a mistake. It's better to try to hope for the cooperation, give them a chance some of the time. This is a mixed strategy. This can be done randomly, so it, it cannot be exploited. But this side will not know when the side will be generous and when not. So, if he comes back to cooperation, then this strategy will always cooperate the next time. If he doesn't, this, 
a good chance that it will break down. But then if two of these are playing together, they can always, they will always arrive at cooperation. So in these evolution and simulations first, everything tends to break down the purely the, the non-property of one shot behavior that takes over. All the organisms will be affected. But then some of them will evolve to do this type of thing, tit for tat. After further evolution, maybe thousands of generations of trees, this type of strategy evolved. And there's another type of strategy that also evolves, which the biologists call Pavlov. <coughs> the, the strategy called Pavlov, each player or each <coughs> organism, reacts sort of like a, a Pavlov dog. It's like it reacts as if it were being conditioned by what happens to it to do something or not to do something. So this is a very simple strategy with also a limited memory. <coughs> if at the previous time it cooperated or did not cooperate, <coughs> if it was successful, if it was lucky in that, depending on the way it matched with the other side, then uh, it continues the same thing. If it, if it places the cooperative strategy C, it considers itself lucky if the other side cooperates. Well, that's always good. So, if it, if it cooperates, the other side cooperates, then Pavlov will cooperate again. On the other hand, if it did not cooperate, and the other side cooperated, then it would fail to cooperate again. It would defect. If it defected and, and won by the other side cooperating, then it would defect again. Now, two, two Pavlov strategies, if they're both cooperating, they will continue to cooperate. It's stable in that sense. But this is, this behaves very well under evolution in simulations. It's not something that was thought of before these simulations were undertaken in a, a computer form. But it was discovered that as soon as this type of strategy appears, then this type of strategy is also affected. <coughs> develop a mixture. If you allow more complicated memory, you can have uh, more complicated strategies. You can have a strategy that will forgive one act of detection, but not two. Or, and then which will maybe punish uh, the other side's detecting from idea cooperation for a certain number of steps, but not forever. And things get more complicated. There's really no limit to what can be done if more, more memory is allowed, more complicated strategies. Another biological angle that was developed, oh, by the way, I meant to say it earlier, but you can really interrupt me at any time if you want to have questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to cover the whole area of game theory. Or all the details of this thing is better to understand than just to uh, absorb lots of information. And I, I should mention also uh, this Christmas dilemma that I'm talking about. There is a book that goes into this, it has the history of it. So I think I got some of the information by referring to this book. It's a book by William Townsville. A popular book appeared in 1992. And this is generally available. And it has a lot about the history of game theory and the particular interest in this particular form of game. Another biological concept that's related um, has a lot of attention. 
called the concept, the abbreviated as GFS, or evolutionary Strategy does not often exist if you, if you set up a game in a, a mathematical form. It, uh, it could be a, a, it could be a symmetric two-player game or a symmetric three-player game or it could be non-symmetric, but. Um, well, it's really best, it's really best for some sort of symmetric thing, maybe but any number of players, like a population is interacting with itself. It's a difference between that the <coughs> interaction is essentially that of two members of the population, or it could be more. Oh, uh, well, uh, the examples I showed were symmetric. The, the, the symmetric is like if you have two players, you can just change the names of the players, reverse them, and it's the same thing. That is the simple thing. There are other forms of symmetry. You could have something that is symmetric under uh, a more complicated change, where you change the names of the players, but also change the names of the strategy. The symmetry can be a more complicated. But the simplest concept is where it's just slightly symmetric. Uh, so the evolutionary stable strategy is the for idea of uh, a population of organisms that are somehow interacting. And an evolutionary stable strategy is a pure strategy, which is also an equilibrium, is, is the best against what the uh, the best strategy in relation to what the other organism, other interaction of one organism with other <coughs> with others, the best payoff. And it's a pure strategy; it doesn't involve some mixture of different strategies. It's some probability of that, or probably that. First thing, the population, that would have probably one genotype and probably another genotype, like, like a gene. Um, but also, it's considered to be such that you cannot move away from that strategy and, and maintain uh, a good equilibrium. You cannot move away without being forced back to them. Um, so it's it sort of be a pure strategy that has a mechanism so that the evolutionary process would tend to force any deviation from that back to that. And this was a good uh, one called J. Maynard Smith, British I'm not an expert on this also, but it is a related concept. But what happens in these prisoners of dilemma simulations from a biological point of view, there isn't actually this type of a strategy. It can't simply, it doesn't evolve to where there is simply one simple strategy that is optimal in the two games. There could be some mixture. You could have Tip for tap, but you could also have generous tip for tap. Uh, or you could have a Pavlovian behavior, and you could be interactive. And you could have more memory than it's the most, most complicated. So, uh, I don't think I should say more now unless uh, there are uh, questions. What exactly did you study in the Nobel Prize for? Mm -hmm. no. I was curious. Well, the Nobel Prize 
was, uh, was given to three persons. The two of them are, are regular economists. Uh, John Grassani of the University of California, Reinhard Selton of Bonn University of Germany. <coughs> but these are also people in game theory, and there's mention of games to economics. It turns out that Selton was originally a mathematician. He had a degree in mathematics. Asani was also strong in mathematics, he didn't have a degree. His first degree was in economics, so I think something that he also had a pharmacy degree. He then did his, he then developed his career a little later. He's older. But the citation was the, the application of non-cooperative game theory in economics. <coughs> the, the, the word non-cooperative and cooperative is really my contribution. And there's a whole area of cooperative games uh, the, in the spirit of the norm and moment of coalitions and the interactions of possible coalitions. Um, <coughs> That has not been, uh, that's not been exhausted or perfected yet. There's, there's no accepted theory for that, really beyond two player possibilities. So it's, it's really an open area for research. Uh, <coughs> so it's the economic, and this is not economic, the biology is another area where Game theory ideas are also are also studied. Also, there's of course politics. There, there's you could study voting power, and uh, there's some things like the Shapley value is a game theory concept that can be applied to measure how much voting power, like how much what is the vote of a West Virginian worth compared to that of a Californian. It might, could be worth more because, uh, not because of the congressmen, but because of the senators. In California, there are millions of them, but they only have two senators. They have two senators from the relatively a smaller number of West Virginians. But in the game theoretic analysis, big states have a lot of power because uh, uh, it's, uh, you can more easily form a winning coalition with a few large states. And the smaller states tend to be sort of go along in the mass, and it's not so easy to win elections uh, for president. It's a sort of thing. So you, when you make an electoral uh, college analysis of in terms of theoretical voting power, it's not clear that the West Virginian is, uh, has more power than the, the Californian. Well, but as far as the Senate is concerned, it's clear. <laughs> per capita. Yes? Um, after studying game theory, if you were put in a situation which um, would you check the cat or family or life or password? What do I do? Yeah. Well, in these situations are not uh, exactly what you ordinarily encounter in human relations, and it's, it's very tricky. Uh, in fact, I think it's, it's, I've made the mistake myself in trying to apply game theory thinking to human relations, because you really should uh, realize that you're one of these biological organisms. And that you might make an analysis of something on a non quality <coughs> basis when it's rational behavior. And it might be good if you were a corporation, but, uh, which could be, could be immoral. But you're not a corporation. Uh, you don't have stockholders. You are a biological organism and you have instincts. So, uh, For a corporation, it might be best just to uh, uh, try to accumulate a lot of money and subsidiaries and stuff and not uh, 
when seeing of any merger superstitions, that that corporation should exist. But humans may be better off to marry and have good families. And that's a good reward. But this requires the form of corporation. So the, the instincts uh, will drive you in that direction, but you might not be driven in that direction very easily by a deep theoretic analysis. This uh, the most elementary type. This is why this evolution of corporations involves considerable subtlety. The phrases for them as a rational behavior is not to property, but it seems absurd to the sort of common sense thing that humans can avoid the reverse punishment by being more cooperative. The thing is, they can evolve to do that in a repeated situation. These things are always occurring. There's always times there are interactions where you can steal, you can rob and steal, and do various things, but then you can be punished for it if somehow it didn't. But human society evolves so that there doesn't have to be too much police work because the instinct to behave in a cooperative fashion. If we were less cooperative, there would have to be much more police work. And more of the total economy would be done to get what we go into police and correction. So that's the Well, well it's, it's, it's not arbitrary if you want that the non cooperative equilibrium to be the defense strategy. If R, uh, if P has to be bigger than R, if, if R were the biggest number, if you get the great payoff, you just start cooperating, you don't get <coughs> by defecting where the other one cooperates, and uh, it's bad if neither cooperates, then the non-cooperative equilibrium would be possible. You don't want that. It's not a dilemma. That's a business dilemma. If there isn't a temptation not to cooperate, that's part of the story. Uh, this is uh, what is generally done. And, I, I'm just quoting this actually because I, I haven't I haven't been working on the first of the amendment history. But this is uh, I am working on the original idea of non property solution. But this is what it's grown from this one an area that has developed. And of course it's just something that exists uh, Someone will come in and introduce some words at some time, and they'll be taken on like equilibrium or cooperation, non cooperation, uh, strategy, game, theory. The theory of games, this is a phrase. So this can be traced back not to the Norman, but actually to Armand Borel, if you were really to translate the French. I mean, Emile Borel, I'm thinking of another method. <coughs> so there's this, this sort of scientific history, but the principle is always it exists and just to be discovered. And someone gets nominally credited with uh, introducing the word. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not really sure you understand about R, but the two R is uh, greater than S plus C. Does that mean that um, in the you know, revolutionary long run that the uh, revolution favors stability in, um, in cooperation other than S plus T. I, I'm not, uh, I just, I found this is, this is what it's always used uh, when the uh, evolutionary biologists consider these examples. That means that uh, the, what the total that both would get uh, 
that what they would both get uh, cooperating would be more than the average that they would get if one were cooperating and one were not cooperating. But I, I, I think that's not something that's required on some truly game theoretical basis, but it's, it's sort of preferred to preferred choice. But you can you can make scale transformations if you make it non-symmetric. This this is what implies a symmetric form, but uh, you could uh, multiply one size payoff by ten, and it would be the same thing. Or you could you could add uh, seventy-seven to the numerical payoff for so one side, and it's still the same because they are not carbon. They cannot exchange any of these units. It could be units of a separate currency. 